that none of this has happened and we're just going to resume with um, today's program. So as I've already said, I'm Claudia Kane. I'm the director at Scoville Library and I apologize for, um, for not getting this Zoom thing right, but here we are. And so uh, for those of you who have better Zoom etiquette than I do, please keep yourselves muted during this presentation. And if you have problems, um, with your Zoom end, sometimes logging off and logging on is really helpful. So um, today we are here for a program called Grizzly Stories, Reflections on Natural History and Advocacy. And our presenters- are Probably nobody would want to turn to me to figure out Zoom. Uh, and also, I mean, it, I, uh, what Louisa and I are sitting here looking at ourselves. So I guess <laughs> I'll talk to myself as, as far as the introduction goes, realizing there's a bunch of people out there um, anyway, I'm, it's great to be here uh, with all of you this afternoon, albeit virtually, and I appreciate that you have all made time to be here as well. And I'm assuming that what unifies us here at this point in time is a, at least a certain amount of curiosity about grizzly bears, maybe fascination. Um, so Louise and I are hopefully going to satisfy uh, some of your curiosity. I'm going to start, as Claudia said, uh, with my part of the presentation about talking about uh, bears, the bears as such, but more specifically trying to focus on what differentiates grizzly bears, bears in general, from any other terrestrial mammalian carnivore, what makes them unique, special, even miraculous, but even focusing more than that on grizzly bears in the Western United States, why our bears in particular are, are unique and special as well. And then Louisa is gonna follow me by uh, talking about human bear relations. So now with some trepidation, I'm going to try to start um, the PowerPoint that I have. Um, so you should be seeing a, a PowerPoint that is not yet started. And um, and I'm, I've got this little thing in the way. And here we go. All right. So hopefully you can all see um, the PowerPoint, the, the title slide. So again, this is my part. And it's about the grizzly bears themselves. And uh, the subtitle is Miracles, Peculiarities, and a Bit of History. So as you will see as I get into my uh, part of the presentation, uh, in some ways, uh, grizzly bears are not only peculiar, unique, but they're also genuinely miraculous. Uh, the bit of history has to do with why grizzly bears uh, in North America are um, special relative to all the other brown bears, grizzly bears in the Northern Hemisphere. So thinking about the miracles and peculiarities of grizzly bears, probably the best way to get into that is to simply ask the, ask the question and attempt to answer it. Uh, what makes a bear? What differentiates a grizzly bear from any other mammal uh, or grizzly bear from any other bear for that matter? So to start with then, it's worth looking at the seasonal cycle. Um, this is a little bit abstract, but basically what we're doing uh, here is going left to right from January 1st through de December 30th through the course of a typical year. Uh, the bottom axis is also registered as Julian date, which is basically the same. So we're looking at an event timeline as the year progresses, uh, starting with most prominently the amount of time that grizzly bears spend in a den. So these different shades of blue represent the amount of time spent in a den by different sex and age classes. So just the different shades, shades corresponding to say an adult male versus a female with cubs. But hopefully the vision, what this, conveys is the visual impression that um, grizzly bears that dance, spend a lot of time in a dark hole in the ground between three and six months, largely not moving. So imagine that. And I'll get back to denning and hibernation a little bit later, but that's, that's phenomenal, um, at least for me. And then of course, bears come out of the den and they start foraging and this wavy gray line uh, represents sort of the uh, typical levels of feeding by bears during the course of the active season. And that feeding activity peaks starting about mid-July 
uh, and lasting up until when the bears go back in the den. It's a period called hyperphagia. And it's during this period of time that grizzly bears ingest a huge amount of calories, much of that converted into body fat, the body fat then going to sustain the bear uh, while it's a hibernation and the spring thereafter for roughly three to six months. But then correspondingly, um, levels of feeding activity are least earlier in the year uh, during the time that bears breed. Uh, and breeding season is centered on roughly the first week of June. Now this scheduling makes perfect sense because the peak abundance and quality of food is available to bears in the fall during that period of hyperphagia. So they're breeding at a time that when it doesn't get in a way of when they need to be feeding most. Um, so it makes perfect sense. Interestingly, when we look at um, ungulates, which is to say large hooved herbivores like deer and elk, moose, uh, it's exactly opposite. They breed in the fall, but then the greatest pulse of rich foods, highest quality foods for an ungulate is in the spring. So the scheduling makes sense for bears, but it uh, poses a bit of a problem for an average female um, because Figuratively speaking, she's got going to know in June whether she's going to have put on enough body fat by the time she hibernates to sustain a pregnancy. So what we have is this phenomenon um, of delayed implantation. So you have the egg being fertilized, the initiation of an embryo, it develops, in, develops into this ball of cells called a blastocyst, and they don't implant, they're free floating for roughly 170 days. But thinking about that then, um, if a female is not in good condition when she goes into den, then she can spontaneously abort without having invested a lot in an embryo. So it's a, a great little uh, strategy for bears in terms of life strategy. So uh, uh, the female goes into the den, she's in the den roughly in November, implantation occurs, followed by a remarkably short gestation, only two months after which cubs are born, typically two, sometime in January in the den. Um, but this begs the question of why such a short gestation, especially given that these cubs are the size of a teacup. They're remarkably small. Well, when you think about it, when a female is sustaining a fetus through the placenta, she's drawing on her lean body mass. And if that were to be sustained <clears throat> while a female is in the den, it could be lethal. So there's an imperative to get these cubs out so that she can then sustain them with lactation, which draws on her body fat. And typically a female will have ample body fat. So it's a fascinating life strategy organized around hibernation and all the imperatives that come with that. And hibernation itself is truly miraculous. So again, for three to six months, a bear is in a dark hole in the ground. It's not urinating, it's not defecating, not drinking, not eating. If we tried to do that, we would be dead inside of five to seven days. But even more miraculous, there's no loss of muscle mass. There's no loss of bone density or strength. There's no kidney failure. So needless to say, these phenomena have fascinated medical researchers who have been trying to unlock these mysteries with obvious implications for human health. We have a long ways to go. And again, while hibernating, the female is giving birth to a cub, but again, a remarkably small cub. So this is a little abstract but it's showing basically the relationship for a number of mammalian species between the mass of a mother and the mass of the newborn are called the neonate on that up vertical axis, the y-axis, the mother's math, mass on the x-axis. So each one of those dots represents data for a different mammalian terrestrial species. And you can so that, see this main trend line. And as you might guess, these brown dots represent the bears and the point of that is relative to the mother's body mass, again, cubs are remarkably small 
of all mammalian species, roughly the smallest relative to its mother's size of any. And the only reason a bear can carry this off, a female can carry this off, is because she's doing all of this in the safety and security of a den. So she can afford to give birth to teacup sized cubs because they're sequestered in this hibernaculum. And thereafter, they can sustain themselves, grow, feed off her milk. And by the time they emerge from the, the den, they're able to get around and therefore much safer. So again, a kind of a mind boggling set of tactics and strategies that bears have evolved over the millennia. But to carry all of this off, carry all of this off requires a huge amount of body fat. And so then we have the classic shape of a bear, which is roly poly. In fact, bears are obese. Um, again, another miracle attached to this from my perspective miracle is that despite being perpetually obese, they don't experience type two diabetes. So another mystery that medical researchers are trying to unlock again with obvious implications for uh, human health. So in the case of bears, obesity is indeed beautiful. And by virtue of the importance of body fat, in turn then, high fat content foods are critically important to bears. So for example, we have army cutworm moths, uh, which are consumed by grizzly bears uh, throughout the Northern Rockies in alpine environments. These moths are about 50 to 75% fat. Some people call them little fat bombs. Um, so a few interesting facts about bear consumption of army cutworm moths in sites like this one, in some of the most, most remote rugged portions of the glacier and Yellowstone ecosystems. Uh, and the moths are in these areas because they're there during the summer to feed on the nectar of alpine tundra flowers. They do that beginning at dusk through the night, during the day they come back, they crawl down into the rocks, which is where the bears concentrate then flipping back the rocks to gorge on literally slithering masses of moths down below. You also have foods like the seeds of white bark pine. So here you see the, the, the tree and the cone, the seeds, which are 20 to 25 to 35% fat, kind of, sort of like pinion pine seeds. Um, and importantly, there's a connection here, consumption of seeds with a rodent, a, a, a squirrel, the red squirrel, the tree squirrel. The problem is that these cones stay up in the top of the trees unless you have squirrels come by harvest the cones, bring them down to ground level, concentrate them in what are called middens, which are basically these hordes of cones, after which the bear merely needs to find a midden and thanks to the hard labor of the squirrels, excavate the cones, eat the seeds. And they do remarkably fastidiously, um, they'll break a cone apart and eat virtually no cone scales, all seeds. Another thing that makes a bear that's really distinctive about bears and something that we might not think about at first blush, which are the front limbs. Um, they have highly dexterous front paws, nearly as dexterous as um, primates. They walk flat footed, plantigrade, um, like us on the basically on the palms. Uh, these paws are powered by massive forelimbs. The muscles to which are attached to a robust scapula. And then on top of it, you have these massive, what are called suprascapular muscles above the scapula that constitute the, the hump. This design makes sense. It creates a really powerful front leg, a very dexterous front leg, which then allows them in turn to grapple with prey. Um, for example, this grizzly bear taking down a bull bison, somewhat fancifully rendered by Charlie Russell, a Montana uh, artist who worked in the early 1900s, late 1800s. More importantly though, it allows them to efficiently dig 
for roots. Um, in the Yellowstone ecosystem, for example, yampa roots, sweet sisley roots, biscuit roots, spring beauty roots, also for rodents like pocket gophers, not only the gophers themselves, but also the root caches that gophers make. And digging is really a signature activity of grizzly bears, and it differentiates them, say, from black bears, that grizzly bears are able to do digging much more efficiently um, and gain energy from it. Finally, they have a simple digestive tract. They're monogastric, like we are. So the upshot is, again, I'm showing, I'm showing myself to be a scientist because I need to present charts and graphs, but in any case, here what you have, um, a, bunch of different, a bunch of different bear foods, and they're grouped into different categories like foliage and roots and fruits and seeds and invertebrates and vertebrates. The, the black bars, the height of the black bars or black dots above the base there is proportional to the digestibility of each food. So from that, you can see that they have the greatest difficulties uh, digesting foliage, most easily digest meat from vertebrates, not surprisingly. So a steak is not the same as a salad. So not unlike us. But that means then that meat is actually a really important food for grizzly bears. And it turns out that grizzly bears throughout evolutionary history have in fact eaten a lot of meat, including for example, meat from bison. And it's probably the case that on the Great Plains when we had both bison and grizzly bears there, that, bison, that grizzly bears largely subsisted on bison meat or the meat from elk wherever Grizzly bears live with elk and continue to live with elk. So that's setting the stage um, in terms of what I see is particularly signifying about grizzly bears. Um, so to, again, unique and miraculous in its own right. But getting to what is, uh, it further differentiates grizzly bears on this continent from bears anywhere else, we have to dig back into history. Um, 70 to 55,000 years ago. Here we're looking at a map of North America tilted down towards the bottom here. Um, this is, these arrows are pointing towards the North Pole. So again, 70 to 55,000 years ago during the last ice age, the, ice, the Wisconsinan, everything in white was covered by ice at the time. Uh, but importantly to this story, we have this landmass called Beringia. This was a landmass that connected Eurasia to North America, creating this supercontinent. Um, and Beringia came into being by virtue of lower sea levels. A lot of that water caught up in these ice caps. But this period of time is important to the story because this is when grizzly bears first arrived in North America, comprised of three different genetic lineages called clades two, three, and four. So it was about this time though that we had a few fleeting ice-free corridors between the Cordilleran ice sheet to the west, the Laurentide ice, ice sheet to the east. Through these corridors then slipped a few bears to mid-latitudes, but the only ones that survived were descendants of these clade four bears. Shortly after they got here, the door literally figuratively slammed shut with coalescence of the ice sheets. But interestingly, these clade four grizzly bears at mid-latitudes were not alone. They were part of this bestiary, this menagerie of very large herbivores and carnivores. And of the carnivores, we had truly immense ones like the giant short-faced bear, another species of short-faced bear, our version of the lion, dirk tooth cats, saber tooth cats. All of these could have readily killed a grizzly bear. So it's interesting to think about the furtive life of a grizzly bear at mid-latitudes during the last glacial maximum, trying to avoid these predators as well as potential competitors. So we move forward to 25,000 years ago, and that's notable because for some reason, and I, uh, it, this is a whole story in its own right, grizzly bears went extinct in Beringia. So fast forward, yet several more millennia to the early part of our current ep epic, the Holocene, about 11,500 years ago, 
before Beringia disappeared, we had a recolonization of Eastern Beringia by a different genetic lineage of bears from clade three. But even more notably, we had a mass extinction of herbivores and uh, carnivores. So the upshot of that was that the largest of the large carnivores left standing were grizzly bears, the largest of the herbivores were bison. So we had clade three bears to the north, clade four bears to the south, uh, rapidly melting ice, an ice-free corridor, bears from the north moving south, bears from the south moving north, met in what's now central Alberta and mingled. But importantly, clade three bears never got further south, meaning that all of the bears that we currently have at mid latitudes in North America and that we have had throughout the Holocene were of this ancient clade four lineage. And importantly, clade four bears went extinct everywhere else on earth with the exception of an isolate on the island of Hokkaido in Japan. So our bears are unique. They're special because they're the only survivors other than that isolate on Hokkaido of these clade four bears. So this is how things sorted out towards the end of the Holocene. Um, everything in dusky green, light green is where I reconstruct we had bears. And fast forward to the arrival of the Europeans. And um, from my perspective, uh, a tragedy in some respects because it was the beginning of a number of extinctions and extirpations relevant for grizzly bears. Uh, here I'm showing again where I reconstruct we had grizzly bears in what is now the contiguous US around 1800, which is when grizzly bears were encountering significant numbers of Europeans. 50 years after that, they were extirpated from the central and southern plains, um, everything shaded here in yellow. 60 years after that, they had been extirpated from 90% of the places they lived, uh, left in small scattered populations represented by these green blobs a lot of these populations at the time probably no more than a couple of bears. 60 years after that, this is what we had left. A few bears in the North Cascades, a few bears in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado, at least up to 1979. Most of our bears in ecosystems centered on glacier in Yellowstone National Parks. Um, and we lost not only bears and bear distributions, but we also came close to completely losing a lot of ecological relationships and behaviors. Um, for example, looking at white bark pine, everything in light green is where once grizzly bears ate lots of white bark pine seeds. But because of the joint extirpations of grizzlies and white bark pine, the only place left in North America where grizzly bears eat significant number of pine seeds is Yellowstone. Something similar with bison. Here in brown is where we had bison around 1500. It's a really complicated, interesting story as to what happened after 1500 because we had a brief surge of bison east, almost to the Atlantic seaboard. Nonetheless, for the bulk of the high Holocene, this is where we had bison. This is where we had grizzlies. This is where we had both. And it's probably fair to say that everywhere in this area of overlap, bison were a critically important food for grizzly bears. But again, because of the joint extirpation of bison and grizzly bears, this is all we have left. This is all we have left in the Northern Hemisphere, only in Yellowstone, less than 1% of the former extent of this relationship. And the reasons for these losses are fairly straightforward. A bunch of Europeans with large caliber firearms and bad attitudes which Louisa is gonna get into more a little later. So bringing us up to the present, um, here we have a map focused in on the Northern Rockies. Everything in red are our current recovery areas where we're focusing on restoring grizzlies under Endangered Species Act protections, which were afforded in the mid 1970s. Everything in green was the distribution of grizzlies at that time. We had roughly 600 bears in the Northern Continental Divide. 350 in Greater Yellowstone, not very many bears anywhere else, all of these populations isolated from each other. 
about a thousand bears in total, but again, isolated populations. So moving ahead roughly 45 years to the present, this is what we have now. Uh, we've doubled the number of bears, about 900 in the Northern Continental Divide, about a thousand in Yellowstone, no gains to speak of anywhere else. Um, so many gains, but these populations are still isolated. Um, and what's even more relevant from my perspective is if you look at where bears could live, here represented by these various shades of light green, this is what's been modeled as being suitable for grizzlies. We could have 3,000 grizzly bears or more, but importantly, all part of a contiguous interbreeding population. So I'll leave that, I'll leave you with that before I hand off to Louisa and with this parting shot. <laughs> Okay. So thank you, Claudia. Thank you, members of the Scoville Library. And uh, thank you, David, who is an artist as well as a science guy, um, and really made uh, what would have been a meager uh, presentation a little more lively and beautiful. And I should also thank Phil Giuliano, who is a cartoon artist, and you've seen some of his illustrations, and you'll see some more today. And, and what I'm going to say, um, should sound familiar in terms of coexistence because you all have uh, plenty of black bears and plenty of the issues are very similar among us. And so uh, my talk today focuses on different kinds of power rooted in different kinds of stories and worldviews that shape how we see and manage grizzly bears. And these stories fall into two major categories, uh, respect and reverence for nature and domination and subordination. And my history with the bear began in my late teens uh, when I fell in love with the wilds of Yellowstone country, which was so different from the fenced in lovely, but fenced in and tame farm country in Pennsylvania where I grew up. And I spent a lot of years teaching mountaineering. Um, and one day I had an encounter with a grizzly bear that changed my life. Uh, it was bad weather and I wasn't paying any attention and I nearly bumped into a grizzly bear. Uh, but before he wheeled away and disappeared into the woods, our eyes met for the very briefest second. And I've never forgotten the intelligence and wisdom in those eyes. And I was smitten. I began to write about grizzly bears for an environmental newspaper, High Country News, for my master's work at Yale. Grizzlies became the focus of my work for basically the rest of my life up till this point. And this is Grizzly Bear 399, uh, who's perhaps the most famous grizzly bear alive. And with her offspring that live around, uh, in and around Grand Teton Park, um, they attract an enormous amount of attention and enthusiasm. And I'll touch more on these bears later. So digging into our shared history, I found evidence of a deep ancient connection with bears. Uh, here, a cave bear painted maybe as many years ago as 38,000 years in the Chauvet Caves in France. And ancient sculptures and art highlight the importance of the bear that was seen as an agent of transformation, an animal that can emerge in the spring with new cubs out of a state of seeming death. Indeed, Throughout the Northern Hemisphere, the Earth Mother and the bear were one in the same. We saw the bear as powerful and we wanted that for ourselves. We saw the bear as kin and we learned from them what plants were good to eat when. And we foraged cheek by jowl for thousands and thousands of years. But later a different story emerged, a story of domination and killing. Uh, this is some graffiti drawn in the bowels of the Colosseum by some gladiator, perhaps as he was waiting to die. And it, but thousands of bears and lions and other animals were slaughtered in the Colosseum, this is about 100 AD, for spectacle, only for spectacle. But the Romans were outdone by Christianity in terms of spreading a narrative of domination over nature. And here is St. Corbinian who famously made a grizzly bear carry his luggage. But when Christianity and settlers hit the shores of North America, the story of subjugation of nature was subsumed within the ethos of manifest destiny. And here she's stringing telegraph lines across the country and making the world safe for settlers and trains and commerce. 
as bears and native peoples and bison disappeared over the horizon. And nature was increasingly seen as savage, a story hyped by dime novel and magazine writers, as well as artists like Charlie Russell. And this, as what David showed, is what that ethos wrought, a lot of killing in a very short period of time. And on the lower right of this uh, photograph, you'll see that's Custer uh, with a grizzly bear uh, in the Black Hills of South Dakota that had been shot by an Indian scout. He was very proud of that. And again, the map of where we had bears and what happened and what collapsed. Uh, so less than 3% today of the grizzly bears that we had. And again, this is the last of clade four uh, around greater Yellowstone and the Northern Continental Divide, the last refuges. But then a shift occurred. And we in America began having second thoughts about grizzlies and wild animals in general. And in the early 1900s, scientists like Aldo Leopold, who's my personal hero, began a revolution of thinking, arguing that predators played an important ecological role and that we had a moral duty to protect them. And Leopold codified his ideas about our responsibility in a famous essay called The Land Ethic. And later the pioneering grizzly bear researchers, the late doctors Frank and John Craighead, would capture the imagination of the American public who sat glued to their television sets to watch them work with grizzlies on various National Geographic specials. And they too passionately argued that grizzlies needed to be protected, not persecuted. And we began to appreciate grizzlies for their beauty and as icons of a natural world that was rapidly disappearing. This shift in worldviews about nature was perhaps best documented by the doctor, by the late Dr. Stephen Keller, who was one of my professors at Yale. And he wrote a lot about this topic. And he broke down worldviews about nature into broad categories, which are somewhat helpful, from the negativistic and aversion to nature to dominionistic utilitarian, think St. Corbinian, to scientific ecologistic, so think the Craigheads, to naturalistic aesthetic and humanistic moralistic, think Leopold. And these can be further collapsed, these world views can be further collapsed in basically a view of control and killing of animals as opposed to those who orient to preservation. And they're often called DU and HM just for short and convenience. I hope to not use that too much. And here is what Dr. Keller found, a major decline in utilitarian views and an increase in ecological moralistic people who cared about wildlife for their intrinsic value. And so it's no accident that you saw a slew of environmental laws passed in the late 1960s and early 1970s including the Endangered Species Act, representing this major change of heart that the American public was having and then Congress had it too. So when I entered the arena of conservation shortly after the grizzly bear was listed in 1975, I thought, wow, uh, you know, even though things are dire for the grizzly bear now, uh, our values are changing and worldviews. We have laws in place like the Endangered Species Act. We have new science. Conservation of grizzly bears should be a piece of cake. That view turned out to be incredibly naive. So what managers in Yellowstone Park faced off the bat was a lack of any rules or programs to keep human attractants and garbage away from grizzly bears. And because you have a lot of black bears in Connecticut, you are familiar with the saying, a fed bear is a dead bear because food conditioned bears can become very dangerous. And you have to be smarter than the average bear. But the Park Service and later the Forest Service began taking that problem very seriously through a major public education program and through instituting strict rules about storing food and attractants. Here in the front country with bear proof dumpsters and bins, and in the back country with canisters, food storage um, you know, bins, and systems to allow campers to hang their food as well. And they promoted to uh, the use of electric fence 
uh, to, deter, to deter bears from coming into camp. And communities outside the parks began to do it too, uh, similar bear sanitation programs. And for Yellowstone Park, it really worked. I mean, this graph shows the decline in conflicts in the park after instituting these measures. And today the Park Service, Glacier, Yellowstone, Grand Teton, have proven to be the gold standard for coexistence practices. But the park, but the outside the park, attractants abounded, and, and so did the conflicts. And this became, and of course, livestock, cows and sheep are really gr good grizzly bear food, as, as David mentioned. And so some of these conflicts on public lands became an early part of my work, uh, trying to resolve some of these conflicts. And domestic sheep pose a particular challenge because sheep are, grizzly bears cannot resist sheep. And those sheep herders are always armed. So typically conflicts resulted in dead bears. And my approach, and it still is, um, where possible, is to try to collaborate, to try to get along. And this is me back in the day with a bass sheep herder in Idaho, as the Forest Service embarked on a really contentious but ultimately very successful program that closed domestic sheep grazing allotments in core grizzly bear habitat that reduced mortalities by a lot. But the killing has continued and indeed it has worsened. Um, I, I can't get into it in too de much detail. It's a, a really separate story, but climate change has d destroyed a lot of the whitebark pine in and around the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So bears are venturing closer to people in search of alternative foods and they're dying at much higher rates, uh, which is raising profound concerns about their future. But despite these concerns, and this is under pressure from industry and the states in the Northern Rockies, the federal government in charge of protecting bears decided it was time to strip protections for Yellowstone grizzlies, allow a reopening of the trophy hunt and turning authority over managing grizzly bears to the states, even though the state plans were centered on reducing the size of the Yellowstone grizzly bear population. And so that ushered in a new chapter, the latest chapter in litigation, a long, long litigation effort brought by environmental attorneys who use science, a lot of the science that David put together over the years, as well as other scientists. And the litigation, because of the requirements of the Endangered Species Act to use the best available science, the litigation has been hugely successful. Indeed, it has been a major way for those who espouse uh, more of a preservationist view, uh, including national interests, uh, people from both coasts, and I'll get into that in a bit. The only way to curtail the impact of entrenched local control and user-oriented views was through lit and is through litigation. So this is a list of some of the major cases we won. Oh, sorry. And the roads, as mentioned, say that the roads cases are important because it involved getting a handle on basically unregulated forest service roads that, were, that contribute to killing and poaching of grizzlies because they allow access into some of the grizzly bears most remote habitat. And an important note here is that because of pressure from industry that is internalized in the culture of agencies like the forest service, the federal government wouldn't listen to the scientists of their own experts until the courts made them listen. And this is the problem that you know, people like David faced in their careers. So the latest delisting fight was actually the government's third try, the first being over the, in the context of the recovery plan. And it certainly won't be the last. So, we see that the big policy decisions have been made by the courts. And you might ask why? So I'm gonna to try to get into that. It's helpful to look at state level wildlife management because the states have so much influence over what happens to grizzly bears, especially if Endangered Species Act protections are stripped. 
And you can see this, the face of the state wildlife commissions in our region, almost entirely white, almost entirely male, almost entirely hunters, to some extent ranchers. And so it was no surprise that when I showed up at meetings, which I did for decades, representing a different ethos and members from across the country and being a woman, I was met with eyes rolling and arms crossed. So this is a map. It's also helpful to look at the geopolitics of the country. This, is a, this map is a little bit dated. It was put together by the League of Conservation Voters that score representatives and senators on their support for conservation or not, with the green indicating more support for conservation and preservation and the red uh, more oriented toward control and use. And in the Northern Rockies, where you have grizzly bears, species like grizzly bears and wolves, you have overwhelming support for their preservation coming from both coasts, which elevates the political stakes, heightens the conflicts over these animals, and creates a good deal of resentment among local decision makers. This is a lot of the root of the problem. And this is a conceptual map that tries to take a deeper dive you know, in to explain what is going on. This is, a, again, it's conceptual, hopefully reflecting reality, that shows the power and influence of various entities affecting the major decision maker, which is here, the US Fish and Wildlife Service in the red box. And the spaghetti lines between these entities, whether they're hunters, you know, livestock producers, or environmental attorneys, the spaghetti lines between them indicate directions of influence and connections, with the green lines indicating persuasive influences, things like education, relationship building, lobbying, whereas the red lines indicate coercive influence, as indicated by budget constraints, um, threatening people's careers, or legal constraints through legislation or litigation. So in getting into more detail about the control and use oriented side, you can see that hunters and livestock producers, loggers and energy, uh, energy industry have lots of different kinds of access to the federal political elites who have coercive influence over agency elites and down to federal decision makers. You can see that they've got a lot of lines of persuasion and they've got a lot of direct access to coercive power over agencies' decisions. Here's the other side of this. And again, um, you know, that's a picture of me <laughs> that David took sometime. And, uh, and so, but I was representing for Sierra Club, Natural Resource Defense Council and others, people from both coasts, people who cared about the preservation of these grizzly bears. And you can see that the, environmentals, the environmentalists had fewer lines of persuasion a bit less ability to persuade the federal agency elites and decision makers, and that the only access they had to a coercive power over the federal agencies was through litigation. That's it. So that explains a lot of why environmentalists, you hear a lot of you know, concern about why are environmentalists litigating all the time. It's because that is their only avenue to represent the broader national interests in disputes involving entrenched local control-oriented uh, decision makers. This is what the world would look like if federal protections were removed. And this explains a lot of the hard work to oppose grizzly bear delisting because grizzly bear management would be done through the state. State agency decision makers are where it's at. And you see the lines of coercion from hunter interests, livestock producers, and others to the state political elites down to the decision makers. And the environmental side, again, representing the broader national interests, have very few lines of influence and no ability to coerce, you know, make anybody do anything. And that's why the groups have fought so hard, not just because the science didn't support delisting but because the vast majority of the public 
anybody who doesn't live in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming would be disenfranchised. They would be completely unable to affect any change in action. So again, this is uh, back to the first graph and the status quo with Endangered Species Act protections restored, um, well, upheld by the Ninth Circuit uh, Court last year of a lower court ruling that was the latest battle on delisting. So this is grizzly bear management under the Endangered Species Act, except now, if I were to do this map, the colors should be brighter, the red and the green, to show an incre the increased polarization of both sides in this debate, as with so many issues across the country. And the polarization reflects the inflation of the grizzly bear as a cultural symbol, a symbol either of the unwanted and heavy hand of government on one side, or a symbol of the wild in an increasingly congested world on the other side. And a recent article in the New York Times uh, featured conflicts over grizzlies and wolves as part of what they called the culture wars. And I agree with that interpretation of what is going on with grizzly bears now. But more changes are afoot. Uh, and, uh, and I think they're gonna take this, this war in, in perhaps some surprising new directions. Um, Native peoples are getting involved. And of course, the Indians view grizzlies as kin and object to trophy hunting, which would be like allowing their grandmother's head to be mounted on a wall. And they've forged a really impressive coalition supporting, for, supporting protections for grizzlies. And they, as sovereign nations, they're demanding a seat at the table. And, and this is Lewan Tyler, who's Sergeant in Arms of the Shoshone Bannock Tribe, signing the 2016 Indian Grizzly Bear Treaty that codifies this request. Over 270 tribes and tribal societies and tribal leaders have signed this treaty. It's the most signed Indian treaty in history. This is Marsha walks along uh, a Northern Cheyenne helping her daughter sign it. And Marsha told me that she hopes her daughter will remember what she considers to be a really historic day. And now uh, the Indians have a sympathetic ally in DC in Deborah Halland, the new interior secretary who's Laguna Pueblo. And the constituency of these celebrity bears like 399 and here's her daughter 610 is just growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, 610 was crowded by 250 people last week from all over watching her. I mean, the enthusiasm and interest for these bears to see them is just enormous. And this year is expected to be just another blockbuster year. So which story will prevail? I mean, those who want to kill and control nature and they feel very threatened and they're very politically motivated or the story of kinship and reverence, which will prevail. I mean, it's up to us and it's up to who has the power and what story they tell. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um... Like I said, I apologize for any of the snafus in the beginning. And if you have questions, um, you can go ahead and put those in the chat and I will read them out. Uh, but that was really fascinating and, and really wonderful. So uh, I learned a lot. I think everybody here learned a lot. And uh, I, for one, would like to see the grizzlies continue and to expand and to be protected. So um, I, I'll give you the one question that I had via email, and that was about uh, any involvement that you have about grizzly preservation in Alaska, and are the grizzlies in Yellowstone different from the grizzlies in Alaska? Well, I can ask her, I can start with the last part of that, um, which was the gist of, uh, of uh, my, my uh, recitation of history. Uh, yes, they are, they're different. Um, it, but it depends on how you reckon that difference because traditionally we thought in terms of subspecies more recently geneticists are thinking in terms of clades which are basically genetic lineages. So all the bears at mid latitudes are of this ancient genetic lineage of clade four. All the bears in Alaska are of clade three 
And there are these more recent immigrants that came across uh, post 25,000 years ago, just prior to the um, submersion of the Beringian land bridge. Mm -hmm. And so far as what's going on in Alaska, maybe Louise is better positioned to, to address that. Well, well, I, you know, I spent a fair amount of time collaborating with other activists and interested people, both in Canada and some in Alaska. Uh, Alaskans for Wildlife was a group I was recently in touch with about the Secretary of Interior. So there's kind of a, a loose conversation going on. Uh, we certainly were aware of the allowing of uh, grizz uh, bear cubs to be killed in their dens and refuges in Alaska, which was a really bad idea. Um, but, you know, it's kind of loose. And it takes a lot even to focus on the Northern Rockies, but we're all connected. And also we are tied in with European conservation efforts too, which is remarkably inspiring. They're doing incredible work in Romania and Sweden and elsewhere. But I think just a bit more about what's going on in Alaska too. Um, there's, I think, some scientific evidence to support the notion that grizzly bear predation on moose calves right. and moose mm -hmm. is reducing moose populations, uh, maybe in some places caribou populations. So then derivative of that is the notion that because of this bear predation, there are fewer moose for people to shoot or kill for whatever, for food. But to a certain extent, it's been, it's been constructed as this zero sum proposition. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have bears, we don't have moose. So I think it really is about, you know, about how do we negotiate this, this um, uh, the interests that are organized around use of animals mm -hmm. versus preservation of something like ecological integrity, natural function. Um, mm -hmm. And that's an ongoing negotiation and it's contentious, obviously. And so um, somebody, and I think a lot of people would like to know if there are uh, websites or organizations that you could refer people to who would like to help. Mm -hmm. I must, you know, conserve and expand the mm -hmm. range of uh, the grizzly bears. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we have a little uh, a site called Grizzly Times uh, that we decided to, to put up um, because nobody else had a lot of information on grizzlies in the run up to the latest delisting attempt. And it's, there's a lot of science, a lot of David's work is up there and blogs. And I've been tied, to, in, tied into the Indian effort for, for quite a while too. Um, I would say, I mean, so, you know, there's Grizzly Times, we've got a fiscal sponsor, so access to 501c3. Um, but I would say the environmental attorneys have been really vital to this effort. And mm -hmm. most particularly, Earth Justice uh, have got an office in Bozeman, uh, Western Environmental Law Center uh, out of Helen. I think their headquarters is on the West Coast. Uh, they have done a fabulous job. And the Humane Society's attorney who litigated the last delisting case was, was phenomenal. Those three groups, the lawyers from those three groups, just kicked it out of the court. I mean, it was it was incredible. If if you're interested more in the coexistence side of things, and there's a lot of work on the ground, you know, trying to bear-proof communities and resolve conflicts with livestock. A lot of really great gr uh, work being done. People in carnivores that David is tied in with is 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 doing great work. Defenders of Wildlife does a lot on that front. Um, who else? Uh, well, Greater Yellowstone Coalition oh, yeah. has done yeah. a fair amount, mm -hmm. which is a more of a regional group. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot of local grassroots groups. Yeah, there's a lot of local grassroots groups like Blackfoot Challenge, which is near Glacier, oh, yeah. is a group of ranchers doing absolutely breathtaking uh, coexistence work, have reduced their conflicts by an enormous amount. So there's a lot of on the ground grassroots efforts that are incredible. Great. Mm -hmm. And um, what is the status of grizzlies in Western Canada? And you mentioned Europe too. Are there grizzlies in Europe? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I run the risk of being distracted here. But yes, for example, Romania, they, they have, uh, depending, you know, the estimates are not precise, not, you know, I don't know how reliable, but probably as many as 8,000 brown bears, the same species as our grizzlies, a different genetic lineage, but same species, basically the same basic, the same behave, you know, behavioral proclivities, if you will. Um, and in an environment, it would be tantamount to taking 8,000 grizzly bears and plopping them down in the Appalachian Mountains. So that kind of environment with those densities of people and 
they've carried it off in Romania. And there, there's that's a whole story, and Louisa has knows more about that. And so far as what's going on in Canada, um, the uh, it's really it's intriguing. Um, the bears in Alberta are actually listed as uh, threatened. There were only 700 bears at one point estimated to the entire province. So we have this notion of Canada as being this vast wilderness overrun by wildlife. That's not the case. Um, so that's Alberta. And they're con considering opening up a hunt again because now they're up to 850 bears in the entire <laughs> province. Uh, British Columbia is the stronghold. I think there's something like maybe 30,000 grizzlies. Uh, but they stopped trophy hunting. They mm -hmm. stopped hunting grizzly bears. It was um, a popular referendum to stop the, the mm -hmm. hunting there. Uh, it, was a, it was an amazing campaign. Uh, so, and for the North and the Arctic in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, um, the, the bears are actually occupying new territory. They're moving progressively east. They're showing up in places along Hudson's Bay where they haven't been seen in recent, uh, in recent times. So it's an interesting dynamic going on up there. But I guess I, I, guess I would leave people with the notion that uh, Canada isn't this vast, untouched wilderness mm -hmm. overrun by wildlife. OK. And I think our final question is, since we have uh, black bears here in the east, mm -hmm. Do the black bears have the same gestation cycle as the grizzlies? Yeah, basically they do. Um, they, wow. it, the, generally speaking, um, I mean, the life strategy is basically the same. Uh, generally speaking, as you go further south in latitude, bears spend shorter periods of time in the den. So the exigencies of hibernation and denning are not as great as you go further south. Um, and uh, black bears in the east tend to more often, rather than denning in holes in the ground, tend to den in hollow trees or under logs, you know, places that are a bit less secure. Um, and if you're interested in black bears and black bear denning, uh, something to look up is the work that's been done by Lynn Rogers in Minnesota, where he's actually you know, filmed black bears around their hibernacula, their dens, uh, and actually gotten little cameras down in into the dens. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. hmm. North American Bear Center, I think is Lynn. Yeah, oh, Bear Society, right. North American Bear Society mm -hmm. in Minnesota. It's just phenomenal. I mean, there used to be little video clips of black bears in dens. Okay, great. Oh, and no, now here's one more question. Um, Let's see. In the early 70s, what other breeds of bear populated the Yellowstone area? Are there more breeds there now or fewer? And then our dogs stirred up a mother with cubs, but she was not terribly aggressive. She just ran them off. I think of grizzlies as more aggressive than that. Is that accurate? Um, <laughs> so starting with the, the breeds, they're, they're were and continue to be two different species of, of bears in Yellowstone. There's, there are, we do have our black bears here as well as the grizzly bears. And the grizzly bears in, in Yellowstone are all of this one genetic lineage. So they're very closely related genetically. Um, uh, but there's contention between black and grizzly bears. And where we tend to have high densities of grizzly bears, we don't have very many black bears. Grizzly bears are known to kill black bears and to dominate whatever the food resources are. So it's, there's some pretty intense competition. Um, and in, insofar as aggressiveness is concerned, uh, absolutely there's a difference. Uh, grizzly bears are a lot more aggressive than black bears. Uh, that, you know, that being said, um, grizzly bears exhibit what I would call a lot of behavioral plasticity. They, they can learn to, um, or there can be cultures of accommodation amongst brown bears, grizzly bears. Mm -hmm. And just to highlight that, um, along the coast in Alaska, you have grizzly bears. Some people call them brown bears, but they're genetically the same. But you have really high densities of brown bears. So they're highly socialized. They're used to living at close quarters with each other around a rich food resource. 
And so the brown bears along the coast of Alaska tend to be much, much less aggressive. So, hmm. you know, I've been within 20 yards of a 800, 900 pound male brown bear, grizzly bear on the coast and felt relatively relaxed as did the, the male bear. That's not what you'll find in uh, interior regions. Typically the bears are much more reactive and aggressive. Uh, that having been said, like with grizzly bears or like with black bears, grizzly bears can get used to the presence of people, mm -hmm. habituate. So they lose that fear response. So they become less aggressive. So although you can say, yes, grizzly bears are more aggressive than black bears, there's a huge amount of um, flexibility behaviorally on the part of grizzlies. So, you know, they can learn to accommodate us if we can learn to accommodate them is maybe <laughs> one, one message. Mm -hmm. We had a presentation at the library earlier in the year on black bears, which showed how um, cooperatively they could live when there were mm -hmm. large groups of them. And it sounds like maybe that's the same with the grizzlies, that if you have a larger population, they live in a more um, congenial, cooperative society, if you will. Is that true or? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, uh, you know, I mean, they're just like different human, you know, you have human cultures that are more aggressive and mm -hmm. ones that are less aggressive. You also have bear, you can think of it as cultures, okay. you know, by virtue of circumstance, by virtue of history, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I don't think we have any more questions, but um, I just want to thank you very much for coming and telling all of us East Coast people about your West Coast bears. And uh, I think, yeah, we've got clapping up there in the in the gallery. So, so I think everybody's very appreciative. It was really fascinating. And thank you very, very much for your time. And um, again, I apologize for the snafu in the beginning, but we all survived and, and here we are. So I'm going to end the meeting for everybody. And again, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. And well, thank this, you. Will, this will be recorded and uh, up on our YouTube channel probably mm -hmm. later in the week. So if you have friends who you think would find this interesting, um, be, be sure and check it out. So thank you.